about a narrative and I feel like they don't look at the full scope of the picture because it's just like, all right, if something, if, if we had an active shooter right now, regular officers aren't going up in there. Right. And so you have to have that type of stuff. Like, let's be real. Can that happen? Yes. Has that happened in Atlanta? Yes. So therefore you have to have those things in place. I, I think one thing, let me, let me follow up to you and Paxton both. Um, and not to push back a little bit, but here's the question I have. You've got one side to fund the police and then you've got your police department. How many times have you guys actually sat at the same table and hashed things out on a, on an, on an official business club, not like this, but come to the table, the head of defund the police, whichever move, Black Lives Matter, whichever movement, police chief, top brass, come there and actually work out your differences. So we've, we've requested that. Uh, we requested that multiple times. Um, they actually did a town hall with them that they hijacked. Uh, they tried to hijack it and wouldn't let the police talk at all. Uh, and they just, they just threw shade and bashed them the whole time. So the second meeting, they controlled it where they weren't allowed to talk freely. They had to be called upon and they only had a certain amount of time. Then they just started writing messages and holding them up in front of the screen. Um, so they're, there's probably some of them that are on the same page as, as uh, Audrey was saying, but a majority, a vast majority of them are anti-police. They don't want that training center built. And when we try to tell them what it's all about and how it's being funded um, without using city dollars so that funds can be used for other programs, they don't want to hear it. They just, and she did an interview. One of the people did an interview and on the interview, she said, we don't want it at all. She came right out and just said it. We don't want it at all. Yeah, if you go, if, if, sorry about that, sorry. But if you go on YouTube, uh, there's an article that came out this morning. And the article is titled, In the Middle of Trying to Defund the Police, Atlanta's Trying to Build a Fantasy Land for Their Police Officers. And they're talking about the, the academy. Now, we started working on this when I was still there. And the foundation has raised over $80 million. So it's going to be paid for without any citizen having to spend a dime of, of their tax money towards this investment. Here's the bottom line. If we really want to put a stop gap in the middle of this crime, right, we're going to have to give power back to our police officers. Uh, I wrote a blog last month that every time someone steps in front of the microphone with a false narrative on the conduct of a police officer, when they know legitimately what they're saying is not true. Oh, you know, you know. No. What you are here. Hey, mute, please mute. Get yourself if you just came in the room, Danny. What's up, buddy? Mute yourself. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Picard. All right, so every time uh, one of those false narratives go out, you know, universal across the country, it takes power away from what we're trying to get accomplished. Uh, you know, there is some unicorn, I call them unicorn questions that never get answered and never get asked. Why did this person resist? Why did this person not comply? Why did it, it end up going bad? And those questions never get asked or answered. And if they don't, it subtracts from the power that the police have. Because now we have created a culture of resisting the police. And if an officer see that type of resistance coming, he's not gonna wanna be involved in that because he don't wanna be on 2, 5, 46 and 11 at midnight or at 6 p.m. Uh, you know, and the results leading to chaos in the city. We just gotta figure a way how to empower our police officers because without it, we're, we're not gonna be able to get anything accomplished. And a lot of that's gonna come from the media is gonna have to push back on these negative narratives. You can't keep telling bad stories. It, de it takes away from the power of police officers. I think the power that the, pop, the people, of, like the politicians have to also speak out on exactly what you're talking about as well. 
because last summer, everybody had so much to say. And now as crime is soaring, don't many have too much to say. It's almost as if the mayor is trying to, hey, just be quiet until you can get up out of here. And it's one of those things where, where's that same energy? Where's the Antonio Brown them, and all those people that were standing against law enforcement? If, if you support them or you like say that, and that's all I think a lot of the officers want. A lot of the officers are confused because everything that they basically learned in the academy pretty much got shaken up in a matter of two weeks. And it's like, uh, do I, don't I, do I, what I do? I don't know. And that's a problem because you only have a split second decision to make in some of these instances. And I took a trip to Chicago last summer and their police department basically under, uh, from the incident that happened at the Burger King, they say, we're just going to answer the after the fact and take a police report. And although that's a, technically that's not what they're supposed to do. Like as a citizen, I wanted the officer, Hey, he just stole my car, go get him. But when you, when you, when you neuter them, what do you expect them to do? It's like, you got to pick and choose like exactly what you said, Picard. What, what do you want? Do you want, I want me personally, I want an officer that's aggressive, that's fair, that does his job according to what he's trained to do. I want him not to mistreat people. I want him to not abuse people. I want him to be honest, but I also want him to be active. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times I, I used to tell a story when I worked off Boulevard, the officers that came over there and really chased dope, chased dope, they found a way to complain on them and get them up out of there. Why? Because he was messing up the money. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, a lot of times people don't want an aggressive officer, but then do you want an officer that sit there like the lady did in Detroit and let a person shooting at somebody drive by? No. So we got to decide what we want. Yeah, I think those are all great points. And and, and I think that the other thing that you guys touched on, again, I think, and I keep bringing up, not just because I'm in the media, but it is hard because like you guys mentioned, we can tell a good story and show an officer who's selfless and, and doing things above and beyond but then sure enough, as soon as there's that one use of force and some video gets out, that erases that whole narrative. And, uh, and, and that, that is, I think, the, the hardest thing just in general, right, in social media, the court of public opinion. I don't think it's just in policing. So many people in this world are convicted. I mean, they are convicted and sentenced before you even know half of the story. So I think that that is difficult. But I also think, and this is just a civilian uh, pushing back, and you guys can take this from me. I also think, though, police have to do a better job of when they screw up to take responsibility because every it doesn't matter if you work for a school district, if you work for a Fortune 500 company, there's always going to be good apples and bad apples. And I think where the mistrust comes is that when, for example, let's talk about what happened over the summer with, uh, with the George Floyd. I mean, initially, had there not been body cameras, those officers are walking around. They would have never even been a trial. We wouldn't even know about George Floyd. So the point is, is that like, if there's not that transparency on both sides, I don't think we can earn trust. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. But what the public has to keep in mind, what everybody has to keep in mind, is that the punishment that the public think the officer deserves might not be uh, supported by the officer's rights, uh, state laws, so on and so forth. Uh, but the difference is, and you know, I'm not anti-media, uh, because, you know, stories need to be told. But to be honest, what's in the A block and what's in the B block makes a difference uh, in the communities. So if an office does something bad, you know, and I know that that's going to be in the A block and it's going to be in the A block for seven days. But if an office does something good, it might be in the B or the C and it gets those 15 minutes and never ran again. So we cannot have the balance that you're asking for if the stories are not told with the same amount of balance. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah makes perfect sense. Absolutely. I don't think we're perfect at all either. I think we make a lot of mistakes too. Um, why don't we, you guys want to move on? Let's, we got a, a lot of different topics that we can touch on uh, tonight. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about, because I think we touched on this last time we were in person and it got really deep. And, and I think it's something we can all relate to. 
um, is during this pandemic and, and mental health. And I think there's been this stigma in this country for a long time, and especially in certain communities, there's a, a, more of a stigma than others. But I think when you look at healthcare workers, law enforcement, uh, people are starting to talk about, you know, mental health. And I think, you know, you're asking officers to go into these stressful situations where people are having the worst days of their lives and, and to get control. So I don't know, Ty, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on mental health? If there's enough training for officers, do they have enough resources when they, you know, they see some pretty fucked up shit? And I mean, what kind of what kind of treatments out there? What kind of resources? There, when it comes to mental health, each situation is different. And even with proper training, crisis intervention training, you still don't know what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with. So it's almost like you have to have a certain mindset, but at the same time, each situation is different. Working as a, a street cop, you're dealing with people that not only do they have mental illness, they have an addiction a lot of times and they've mixed drugs, alcohol along with their mental illness. So a lot of times they're not in their right space at all. And it's one of those things where a lot of times it's not a police issue because a lot of times the family can't, if you can't handle your uncle that's off his meds and he high, you call the police to handle it. But at the same time, he's trying to rip the police officer's face off what the officer supposed to do? Like, it's that, well, he harmless. If he's harmless, why did you call me? You know what I'm saying? And so it's one of those things where we have to, honestly, they need to have something in place to send instead of police because a large majority of the calls that officers ha handle isn't a police issue. Somebody having a mental episode and won't take their meds is not a police officer issue. And for us, all, all we do is try to calm them down and then see if we can take them to Grady 13, and then they spend 48 hours being evaled, and then they're back out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, think about that. Like, really? So I'm basically babysitting someone because they're having a mental episode. I didn't go to college to be a psychiatrist. I don't know psychotherapy. You know what I'm saying? And I have to deal with that. Now, granted, as a human being, I learned compassion to say, all right, this person ain't in their right mind. Let me try to be easy with them. So I don't have to put my hands on him or he don't put his hands on me. But at the same time, everybody's different. Some people have less tolerance and that's and sometimes that's part of the problem because when you're dealing with somebody that's schizophrenic, on crack, pop the molly, and they're talking to you and they're talking to three different wavelengths, you sitting there looking like, who is, what is up with this guy? I had a guy on my beat. He was six foot five, 280 pounds. And if you gave him a Snickers, he would calm down. But that took me getting to know him to know that, hey, let me keep me a Snickers or some type of candy bar on me. So when he go stand in front of the coffee shop and they want him to move and he taking his clothes off, let me take him to Snickers and get him on about his way. And I ain't even taking him to Grady because taking him to Grady is a revolving door. Now, now, oh, sorry. One issue we run into here in Atlanta and in, in with mental health, that it's definitely, police don't want to have to deal with that. We don't want to have to deal with it. There's takes a lot of training to deal with that. But an issue in Atlanta is that Grady is privatized. So the city doesn't run the EMS service. Uh, that's a private company that does it. So we can't say you need to handle this. Um, they say to us, we're not coming until you show up. So our hands are tied. Now, I will say Chief Bryant's very, uh, he's very pro uh, mental health. They, the department has a lot of things in the works that's being worked on. I was in APLI training last week um, with Dr. Govan, and uh, she, she and I talked at great length about the different things the city's going to be implementing. So I just hope that that stuff goes into effect sooner rather than later. But I think a big issue is the fact that Grady is privatized and they can pretty much do what they do what they want. Yeah, what about you, Natalie? Craddock had her hand up first. Oh, I'm in no rush. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, I, on the, clock. the issue with the mental health thing is that 
for one, like Ty say, we, a lot of times the individuals that's in a mental health crisis, they're not looking for the police. They're looking to go to Grady. The issue is when they get down to Grady, then they're in and out of the door for 45 minutes because they, you I don't know where, maybe it used to be a 48 hour hold, but baby, that's not happening no more. You get, you get a good 30 minutes and the call has came back up because now they're acting a fool down at Jesse Hill in Coca-Cola or Jesse Hill in Edgewood, wherever they are. But the, the, the thing is, is it, it's, it's a lot of dimensions to it. We wonder why the police aren't able to be everywhere. Well, that's because in zone five out of the 14 of us, a good five of us are sitting on a mental health patient waiting on Grady and Grady is taking an hour and a half, two hours to respond. So we're tied up. We, they, don't, they don't let us leave. We can't code nine to Grady if Grady ain't there. Before, if they say it's nonviolent, Grady still wants us there before we get there. So it's a, it, that, that's where an issue is. Why aren't officers available? Because we're sitting on mental health patients that don't even require police. They're literally sitting on the, on the curb at the gas station just waiting for Grady to come. And I'm sitting there doing my paperwork waiting on Grady to come. I, I, it's waste. It's a waste of resource. At that point, is how I look at it. I mean, it sucks, but it's a waste of resource. I'm sitting on somebody waiting on Grady with them while they wait on Grady, and that's what they ask for. Um, but but that's what I have to do. It, it, I don't I don't get the option of, you know, well, Grady's on the way. If you need me, let me know. We don't we don't get that option. So then, when Grady gets there, they they're fed up with them. And again, the call is going to come back up because they're just going to take them down to Grady or take them to Emory and they just release them. They don't, they don't, I don't know what their resources is or what their availability of medication and stuff like that. I don't know what their process is. I don't work for them, but it makes it hard for us because we're, these are people that we're dealing with day in and day out. It gets ugly sometimes because they, they, they do get aggressive sometimes. Um, but it's, what do we do? Our hands are tied. Police, police are tied up with mental health patients. Grady is tied up on everything else. And they're very short at the moment. Grady is super, super if we're low, Grady is even lower. We wait two, two hours on Grady to come out to a mental health patient. And in that time, there's robberies that are occurring. There's other crimes that are occurring. It, it, it's the, I would love to know Patrick, what, what the plans are because it, it would definitely be beneficial at this moment. All right, Nat. Hello, Natalie from the GBI. Hey, um, you know, like Craddock and I know the officers are dealing every day with the most severe um, of, of the mental health cases with substance abuse and, um, you know, homelessness and things like that. But National um, Alliance on Mental Illness um, that administers the CIT program, they have a statistic that one in five adults in the U.S., experience mental illness in the average year. And now one in three adults report experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depression. Now, is that saying one in five adults that excluding police officers? That's all adults. So we, everybody is experiencing this. It may not be that extreme, these extreme cases, but you know, I think, you know, the, the public, they forget that we're people too, that we have problems. We have, you know, problems with relationships. We have financial problems. You know, there are, our kids might be bad or something like that. So we're, we're having to deal with all of our everyday living, trying to make it, and then trying to go and deal with other people that are having the same and even worse um, issues mentally so that's why you know i know um like paxton said that you know chief bryant ha is really dedicated to um you know to to the, the 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 wellness not only physical but mental of the officers because it is a lot i spoke to one of my really good friends she she's on the department and she saw she had like three gruesome scenes, like back to back to back a couple of weeks ago. And she said like, she, and then when she got to like one last week, she was like, she, she didn't even really think about it because it was nothing compared to what she had seen a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, you got to just think, think about how we have got to take care of our officers, this mental health, and then the, the physical health goes right along with it, you know, physical fitness and keep, it has a lot to do with keeping your mind sharp and being able to react responsibly on the street. 
I'm done. Sorry. Yeah, no, you make great points there, Natalie. And I think that that's the biggest thing, but um, you know, you got to look at, like, I know Ty always says this, that people look at law enforcement as like robots. They sleep standing up. You guys just clock in, do your job, clock out, go home, don't have families. And all you do is sleep, breathe and eat law enforcement, which is obviously not the reality of what you guys are dealing with. Um, Danny, you're going to make me puke with your video. So we're going to ask you a question since you're up here. Um, obviously, you're one of the few civilians on this right now. What do you think, uh, in general, um, just what you're seeing around Atlanta? I know you got a lot of connections to law enforcement. Um, what do you think are is the biggest issue right now that you see why why police aren't getting uh, the respect or even the support from some politicians? Um, you know, it's it's interesting you ask that. Um... So I think, you know, it's, I think it's a 50-50 split of the support that's coming through to the police department in the city itself. But um, one lady was saying, and I hear one of the big issues I'm getting now is like the person said with the mental health issues. And I don't know if Grady's having staffing issues, but everyone I talk to, they can't seem to ever get an ambulance to come within five minutes. So that's been a big issue from what I've been uh, hearing um but just all in all michael i haven't i you know there hasn't fortunately there hasn't been any you know major issues so to speak with any kind of uh uh race relation issues within the city itself so to speak and you know it's uh it's been kind of calm from uh from my friends for the past you know month so from that standpoint i hope it stays that way but i haven't really had any heard anything to the contrary, other than the mental health issues that uh, that they're encountering more and more. Okay, well, let's let, let's let's change up the subject a little bit. I know Booker, um, you want to talk about what are you uh, what in charge of the cops, which is an acronym. Uh, you want to talk about what that acronym stands for and kind of like what you guys are doing uh, in the community. Yeah, I'm. Um... I work with the uh, with the cops unit uh, pretty much stands for community oriented police protection. Where within within that uh, within that unit, we have several uh, different uh, responsibilities as far as the community. Um, we deal with Hispanics. We deal with uh, animal cruelty. We deal with um, homelessness. Uh, we also deal with uh, the unit that I work in. We deal with uh, convicted felons as they get out of prison with uh, probation and parole. And um, within that, we're also tasked with doing a little bit of everybody else's job that they don't have to do. Uh, detailed out for pretty much everything in the city. Uh, all events, parades and things of that nature, we're, we're detailed out to that. Um, and we really just try to connect um, on a different level, a more intimate, personal level by doing uh, coffee with the cops, you know, uh, police in the park events, things like that, where we can have an intimate setting that's kind of similar to Clippers and Cops, but not necessarily as real. You know, um, we, we, we are going into certain communities, but we're meeting at like Starbucks and things like that. So. I mean, you'll get the concern um, from the citizens, but you won't have the realness of as far as a conversation about what's really going on crime wise. You'll get their concerns, you know, but the concerns of, you know, the average customer of Starbucks is not going to be the concerns that's really, really driving crime. Right now. So, you know, we, we do our best to try to address that. We do our best to try to address the concerns of the citizens. Uh, our seniors, our seniors, uh, especially because they, they typically have a lot of questions about crime and their fear of some of the uh, younger generation that tends to hang out in front of the store that they try to shop at. So we, we try to address their issues and things of that nature to try to, um, you know, affect community policing uh, from, from those perspectives. So Booker, you, you mentioned, uh, you touched on a couple of things, but the thing that jumped out to me was the convicted felons that you guys have. And a lot of times, especially over the last year, a lot of the, the people who are committing these crimes are, are repeat offenders and, and people who have done, you know, numerous cycles in jail and in prison. 
Um, do you think like, I mean, you're getting a chance to talk to them in an environment that's not threatening. You're obviously trying to help them. Um, is it a lack of, uh, of resources? Are we not doing enough as society for, for people after they, they, they go to, to prison and they pay their dues to society? I mean, what do they have when they come out? What, what do these people tell you when you have this conversation? Well, well it, I mean, it's, it's a multitude of issues. Um, for, for, for our side, um, the, the probation and parolees are short, just as bad, if not worse, um, than p- police. Um, you might have one individual uh, officer that might be in charge of supervising four and 500 people. Then you might have a situation where, you know, one, one offender that's getting out, well, yeah, they might have a family member who lets them use their address, but they don't really have a home to stay at. They've been in prison that long and they don't have resources, but then you get out and it's the same thing that you have with the homeless when they get into these, um, when they actually get treatment or when they get the resources, if their structure where they have to follow rules and things of that nature, then that's when they start bucking. Because one thing about it, they don't, they don't want that structure. They got out of prison um, to be free and they don't want that curfew. They don't wanna have to not curse and things of that nature or not drink and smoke wherever they're living. You know? And then with the homeless population, you'd be surprised you know, I know we had that big fight in front of City Hall a couple months ago, but a lot of those homeless, they routinely turn down services um, that's offered. You know, you have a lot of police uh, places that's offering a lot of things, but they're just not taking it. You know, and, and I found that when you have those conversations with them, a lot of it is because they're bucking against structure. And that's, I think what you're saying is, um, correct book like the thing about a lot of it's all about structure for some if you're sending someone back to the same environment that allowed them to offend chances are they're going to re-offend because they're not used to what we think is normal society normal society for them is not that so if you i'll often tell the kids when i mentor it's called the trap for a reason that you trap mentally thinking that one, I'm not waiting, waiting two weeks for a thousand dollars. I can hit the block and get that. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of guys ain't used to, some guys have never worked a nine to five. And once they get out, they're forced to, to meet their probation or parole requirements. And it's frustrating because then some of them have children that they've never been in their lives. They have responsibilities that they've never had to really sit down and be a part of. And so, you have to have some type of structure in place to help get them winged into society. It's not as simple as for most people it seems because when when the going gets tough, usually you resort back to what you know. And for a lot of these guys, for some, they know some stuff that'll get them back in in a, in in the system and stuff like that. Yeah, and then to piggyback on top of that, not only uh, you also feel a lot of a lot of offenders that's. Uh, that's coming out of the prison system that has substance abuse problems. Like they're actively using in 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 jail. You know, I don't know how, but I mean, that's another story. But um, you, you got a lot of people that come out that have substance abuse issues and you have a lot of probation and parolees that's out on the streets with substance abuse issues. And they're sometimes even sent back to after they've been, you know, put in the, uh, the drug pre- treatment program or a drug court and if they fell out of that then at that point i mean what recourse does you have you know because them being addicted to drugs to other crimes to support those habits so it's like it turns into a revolving door because that recidivism rate is going to stay high because of the substance abuse issues that they have Hey Booker, what what is the what does it do to your mentality though uh or the morale I guess I should say when you when you work a case and you get a guy arrested and he's out the next day reoffending again and just over and over. I mean, what, what does that do to the morale of, of police officers and detectives? I mean, I wouldn't, it, me personally, I don't take that. I mean, it sucks. Okay, I'll just, I'll just be real. It sucks. But I mean, how you think as an officer, like I'm a vet, I've been doing this for a little, little bit. So I know the system, I've been around. 
I, I would say that probably when I was uh, when I was young in APD, I probably would take much more offense to it than I do now because I just expect it. You know, um, Fulton County is Fulton County. You know, I've talked to a lot of people that that will say that Fulton, Fulton County ain't Cobb, Fulton County ain't Clayton, Fulton County ain't. Clayton. So, I mean, I've come to terms with that. So I don't let stuff like that bother me. I know it's really frustrating when, you know, if you have to address someone's family, well, why do we have to keep seeing this burglar back in our community? You know, you just, you have to answer that question as, as honest as you can, address their concerns, and then you just have to move on, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a tough cookie, but I mean, you gotta chew it and swallow it. I learned being a detective that although it is frustrating sometimes, if you build the case, like as I became a detective, I start thinking like a lawyer. I'm trying to build a rock solid case where you can get Johnny Cocker from the grave and it don't matter. And once you come to court with airtight tech cases where they can't find loopholes, it, 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 it makes a world of a difference. I think Curry, Curry made uh, one of the biggest cases off of ink. <laughs> <laughs> but he put so much work into that case that th they had no choice but to prosecute it to the fullest. And I think when you're on patrol, you you it's almost like you get the case, take what's right there, and then you leave it at that. As a detective, you got time to dig, 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 dig more deeper to get more evidence. And I think it forces the judicial system to, to work in a certain way because over the last 10 years, I haven't had that same frustration that I did when I was on patrol. So basically what you're saying, as long as you do your job, I mean, you're, the rest will take care of it. Well, it's not, I'm not saying, I, sort of, kind of, but when you're on patrol, you doing your job too. But on patrol, I only can go off what's right in front of me. All right, he robbed a liquor store. Okay, I grabbed him, he's in custody. When the case gets to my, when, when I work gangs in an intelligence unit, when they get to our unit, we digging and we're trying to link him to three and four different robberies. Uh, we going to pull a video. We pull in phone records and all type of other stuff where a, a blind person can see that he's guilty. And it's more to it. But when you're on patrol, you ain't got time for that. You got time to make your case. If calls is piling up on your beat, other people is like, you still out on that? Dang, you been out on that all for two and three hours. What's up? So you don't really have time to put the extra effort into it. Yeah, you know, we got a saying, and sometimes a lot of reporters will say, you know, we're only as good as our sources. What about from a detective perspective? Um, a lot of people, you know, they don't want to snitch. They don't want to be the one, you know, you know, telling on people in their community. They don't want to say who the cancer is in their community. But I would imagine, I mean, there's damn good detectives. But at the end of the day, is it fair to say you're only as good as your sources? That That's part of policing, though. And honestly, after... You learn early on on patrol. It's just like all of us go through the academy. We get the same prop, same training. When you get out on the streets, you become whatever type of officer you want to become. And for some, they do their job and they go home. And then for some, they they got their ear to the street where, like for myself, a lot of times people call me with the information about the crime because they we had a relationship other than when I needed them. I didn't just call them just because somebody got shot. I called them when they their mama was sick. I, I, I called them when they dog died. You know what I'm saying? We talk about the game and different stuff like that where they feel comfortable in talking to me. So when something real happens, they trust that I can cultivate that information and leave them out of it. I'm not going to put them in the discovery package because I know what comes with that. And a lot of officers got to understand that. A lot of officers think, now that I'm here, I'm the law, you're going to tell me what you know or else. And it's like, man, I'm not risking my, you don't even talk to me on a regular basis. Why would I talk to you now? Yeah, that's a good point. Hey, guys, we got about 40 minutes left of this. I know we cut on a lot of topics. Does anybody have, I mean, you could, if you don't want to talk if you're shy, you just want to put it in the chat. Does anybody have any topics they want they want us to hit on? Uh, obviously, this is this is an incredible resource here. We got, we got retired officers here. We got detectives. Um, you know, so any question you have, I mean, really nothing's off limits is, except for ongoing investigation. So um, does anybody have any questions? If you're watching this on our Facebook stream, if you want to put the question right below uh, the stream, 
Um, again, this is uh, this is the time for the community for anybody to ask any question they want. Um, you know, you're getting an opportunity to talk one on one with law enforcement. Anybody? Nobody's but, got anything. We, well, what I'll do is since we don't have anybody talking, I want to bring up Brian. He has a he has a um, a, a device uh, that he uh, promotes to kind of ease the tension between law enforcement and the in the community uh, dealing with a traffic stop. So Brian, are you there? Are you... Are you here? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So yeah, Brian, I... we'll talk about your, your device that you have. Okay, I sure appreciate it, okay. Um, hey, Dennis, what's going on, man? How you feeling? What's up? Brian was supposed to be in town for Clippers and Cops too, y'all. But hey, we had to cancel, man. man. I, I hate it that. <laughs> I had everything up, booked and ready to go, man. But it's gonna come again, man. I can't wait to meet you guys, man, so we can shake hands, man. So definitely. So yeah, so what I've what I've did, man, to to make you guys' job easier, to make my life a whole lot easier, and to protect my son was create a product. And the product that I created is called a Pocket USA. So it's just in case if you're pulling someone over, they will already have their license and insurance in this product. So all you have to do is walk up to their vehicles and you will see both hands visible on the wheel and they will have their license and insurance on the outside of their vehicle. So all you have to do is take this off their vehicle, take it to your vehicle and run a license. I've used to give them a ticket or a warning. You can place it right back in this product, attach it right back on their door. You drive away, they walk away. So this product makes sure that the driver don't have to move. It makes the driver know and feel more comfortable knowing that he doesn't have to move to make you feel comfortable as a police officer. So this was something I tried to do, man, just to protect my son. I created it for my son right before he started driving, just to make sure he survived encounters with police officers. So I'm just trying to bridge the gap, man, be the change that I want to see with my product, man. And hopefully you guys can like, just tell the next person, like if you do pull someone over and you can, Tell them it's a product out there, man, just to make the situation a little bit more safer for both of you, for the driver and for the police officer. So uh, just check out any check out my social media links at the Pocket USA. You will see different police officers. Like I'm going into different cities talking to police officers about this product just to make sure that it get out there. That is something to make a to bridge the gap, to bridge the gap between police officers and uh pedestrians hey brian have you used it yet and, and if you have what's what's your internet what's it, I mean, what kind of reaction do you get from police okay so, so i used it twice i used it twice the first time i used it i was in the white a white area in houston called friendswood and Hold a police on. officer he asked me about the product and not say for god because he said he pulled me over because of my back tail light was out now i was in my work truck and I knew my back tail light went out, but you know, that's how police officers pull you over, right? That's one of the tactics they use. So he seen the product and he liked the product. I, I even went live on my product just to show in live real time how a police officer and how the product will work. The second time I got pulled over, I ran a stop sign. Police officer asked me for my license and insurance. I told him it was right there on the door. He didn't even take my license or go run it. He, we sat there and talked about 10 minutes about this product, of why I created it, what made me come up with it. And I told him it was for my son and to protect my son and all that. So he forgot about the ticket and he said he was just going to talk about it every chance he get. So I did use it twice and it worked how it should work. I think if you can, is it possible, put your link in the chat and then if it's possible to send us some so that we can get them out there. It's like we gotta, you gotta get them in rotation so people exactly. Can... And, and that was my goal to meet you guys this time, man. Just to pass a couple out to each one of y'all, man. Just to make sure when you get to your respective cities, you can just show the show, show the public, man. Show your community that it's something that'll make them feel more comfortable if they was to get pulled over. Um. So, so I have two versions, right? So this one, this was the original. And this one is only $12.99 with free shipping. So this one only attached to your door if you have a metal door, because some vehicles are made of fiberglass and aluminum. 
the pocket 2.0 is only $19.99 with free shipping. Now, this one has a suction cup and it attached to your window or your door still with this magnet. Now, I've been doing this for about, it's going cl close to a year now. And within a year, it's just me working this product on my own, foot to the foot to the pavement, like going into these communities, going into these barbershops. So right now, I'm in Toyota dealerships in Houston. I'm in Turo vehicles. And I'm in driver's ed schools, three of them in Houston. Like, I'm really, I'm really trying to bridge the gap, man. I'm really trying to bridge the gap, and I'm doing it on my own, man. So just by you guys telling the next person about the Pocky USA, man, would be a big help to me. And I think one thing, and the thing about it is it, it'll bring some, it'll bring, it actually most likely will shock an officer. When they see the driver's license and everything on the outside, they'll be like, okay, well, you know, and you were lucky that in both cases, not get a ticket because they want to conversate about the pocket. Yeah, that's right here, Curly. Um, that's great. Ricard, Ricard, you need to mute. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's the that's the one thing that we definitely need to do. And we're we're going to start bringing other things that we can, you know, kind of help bridge the gap between law enforcement and the community and filling that gap. But we also we have Mr. Reed on here. We ain't gonna let you slide out here, Mr. Reed. Don't think you're gonna slide out here. So we're gonna introduce Mr. Reed and let Mr. Reed talk about where he's from and what he does, because this is another side that we wanna help the citizens with understand that if there's a problem, we have another way that you're dealing with an officer and you have something going on and wanna file a complaint and it goes to a certain level. Mr. Reed, it's the floor. Sure. And I want to say again, thank you to you, Ty, and Scotty for being on the uh, the panel we did yesterday. Um, I'm Lee Reed, Executive Director of the Atlanta Citizen Review Board. And for those who may not know, um, our main charge is to investigate citizens' complaints against Atlanta police and correction officers. Uh, essentially, we operate as an external um, external investigative arm of the city when it comes to uh, citizens' concerns about police officers' actions. But that's not all that we do. We also engage in community outreach and awareness. And a part of that is talking about not only knowing your rights, but knowing your responsibilities when you have to engage with officers. Um, because what we see on our end when it comes to complaints, there's a lot of, a lot of lack of knowledge of what's happening when during an engagement. You know, we, we see times when um, officers may have done something wrong, but also where citizens could have benefited from knowing the, uh, the right ways to interact. You know, so we want to bridge that gap also. You know, so that's really what we try to focus on um, as well as doing our investigations. We also offer mediation program because every, sometimes, <coughs> we'll get concerns and complaints about officers where it really is a miscommunication or a misunderstanding that occurred that where the two the both parties could benefit from having this conversation. And the good thing about that is one, the citizen is able to, to um, get to this level where there's a mutual respect and understanding of, for each other and for the, between the citizen and officer and a learning and teaching moment for the citizen and officer as well. Um, so we, we really uh, excited about that program. There's other cities that use mediation um, as, a, as an opportunity to bridge the gap. And then when we talk about benefits of it um, for the officer, uh, if they, they receive a complaint and the citizen and officer are able to work out some type of resolution, that's a complaint that we don't even send over to the uh, police department. It's like it, it just dies right there. Um, so we like trying to push that out. And we and it's not for every type of complaint. It's for those lower level uh, hurt feeling types of complaints that uh, could benefit from a discussion. So that's where that's where we are. And and I want to again applaud you guys for Clippers and Cops because I see it as as something very valuable for the community. And we're gonna keep pushing it on our end because we want 
citizens to be able to, you know, one of the things when we go out and train people uh, about knowing your rights, they still want to hear from, well, what does a street officer say? You know, they, they still want to hear that interaction, but not just in a law enforcement capacity, but in a capacity where we just talk, yeah, you know, and, 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 and while I brought that up, I think someone had mentioned earlier about, um, maybe we were talking about this yesterday, about the, the humanity of officers and citizens. I think sometimes what happens um, when we're looking at certain complaints or talking with the community, we all forget that we're talking with, no matter what uniform you're wearing or clothes you're wearing, you're still talking with an individual, with a human. And the moment we stop uh, looking at there's humans inside the uniform, humans inside the clothes, then we, we're definitely going to have a problem. You know, so that, that's what I wanted to say. And thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak, speak on that. And I'm going to be checking these clippers and cops out quite a bit. This is my third one, so I'm going to definitely be checking them out. Because one of the things that I love about this, too, is actually hearing you all talk and the community talk, um, it gives me additional things to think about and information to pass along to our, our agency and to and the people that we speak to. So I think this is great, definitely. Hey, one question I had though for uh, the pocket, um, how do you keep the water out of it when it's raining or anything like that? I don't know if he's still on here. Is he's there still on, Brian. I mean, I'm just looking at it. Unmute yourself, Brian. Boy, Dennis be on it. I sure don't know how to work this thing. But um, yeah, I got these two two uh, little open holes in here, man. Just if it is raining, that the water would just come out. Okay. If it is raining, but it's 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 pretty tight, man. Like the it's pretty tight just to fit your uh, license and insurance in there. So. Okay. Appreciate the question, though. Yeah. So another thing that we, you know, the city of Atlanta is open that transparency uh, with when involved, you know, officers involved shootings is to kind of take it off the department. And what the city made the decision is to, uh, on any uh, shooting that's involved the city of Atlanta police officer in some other jurisdictions, uh, they allow the, the, the case to be handled by the uh, GBI. Uh, since we have someone on here from the GBI, could you kind of, uh, you know, caveat on that and explain how that process worked? Is she still there? Um, I'm here. Um, so in the state of Georgia, there is no law that mandates that um, an outside agency conducts um, investigations on officer-involved shootings, but we do um, investigate most of them in the state. So we look at that as a good thing. This is that, you know, there, there's no law that's making, but it's the choice that the agency heads are taking to say that, um, you know, they want an outside agency to um, conduct this investigation. But what a lot of people, a lot of what the public does not understand is that we are conducting a criminal investigation. The investigation that we're conducting is to see if there are any laws that have been violated. And a lot of times, I believe the public equate accountability with criminal charges. But the fact is, if a crime was not committed, then they will not be charged with a crime. They will not be arrested. However, the department is conducting a simultaneous administrative investigation to see if there have been any policies that have been violated. That is when, if a policy has been violated, an officer may be fired and can be held accountable that way. But departments need to do a better job of telling the public what that accountability is. Because when they see that the GBI has conducted the investigation and turned it over to the DA, and most DAs now, they're not making those decisions to charge or not. They're taking it to the grand jury. Grand juries, when they look at the evidence, they're not finding that a law has been broken. 
So there's no charges. So what people need to understand is we enforce laws. If you think the laws are not right, then that's, you need to talk to lawmakers to change the laws. But the, um, you know, the, the departments, they still, I mean, they, they still have a responsibility to hold their officers accountable if they have violated some sort of policy um, that may result in some disciplinary action up to termination. But, um, you know, it's good that they need to let the public know what action has been taken and that they actually do take action if there has been a policy violation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so Earl, look at her. Yeah, so what you professional. Did. Yeah, all professional. We thank you, Matt. <laughs> so the next one we want to bring on, since we, we always acknowledge our, you know, public officials or uh, chiefs that's here. So, or, so we want to bring on uh, Chief, uh, Sister Chief Coit. Do you have any words or uh, concerns or comments that you want to address uh, to us here on Clippers and Cops? Are you, I see you out there. You come off mute, Chief. Hello. Okay. You must be busy. Might be just listening in. All right. Uh, let's see here. Jersey. Okay. Jersey. Was that? I okay. Got All right. So, go ahead, Dennis. So everybody been, uh, every, I don't know if y'all noticed since we've been doing Clippers and Cops almost three years, every time I always wear something different that represents Clippers and Cops. And the whole goal is to get our merchandise up and try to, you know, a lot of people want to support and we don't have ways to do it. So I came up with a cool way where we can customize jerseys. Yay. So that's what I got on. And basically, uh, we're still in the infant stage of trying to get a lot of people like, where the link? Where it is? We, we, we bootleg right now. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you can email, text, or something like that, uh, what I need the size, what you want, and then it's $100 to get started. And then each one of the patches is 10, and we can pretty much customize it to your liking. And the whole goal is basically to, we want people to represent Clippers and Cops, and I think this is a cool way to do it. And uh, basically also being true to you and where you're from. There's a lot of people that's from different cities that know about and want to support as well. And uh, it's a good way to get what we're doing out. A lot of people don't know what we're doing. They don't know what we're about. And when they, like yesterday, Lee, when we were on the panel for NACL, people were shocked that we're doing this. And like, we don't get paid to do this. And <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A lot of this stuff comes out of our own pocket and things like that. So. Is this is one way for us to try to help fund some of the stuff like the last one we had food. My buddy uh, provided that food, uh, no cost, you know. So uh, this is just a way to, for us to try to do it. A lot of people have already ordered, so if you can get it, uh, I think uh, you can send it through the PayPal account as well. And uh, it's about a four to six week turnaround to get it created, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in a Clippers and Cops. Pro model jersey too. Well, thanks, Ted. Thanks, Ty. Well, what we want to do is uh, the one thing that we really, really try to bring forth here is the opportunity for you to have the public to have you know some engagement with you know officers. So, if anybody out there, any citizen that wants to come up and something that you have saw or something that you have a question about or concern about, this is your opportunity. And so no matter where you're at, we got people from all over. We got people from Houston. We got people from Memphis on here. We got people from uh, North Carolina, Virginia. So, you know, every agency, um, you know, as a police officer, we're there to serve and protect. That's what we're there to do. And sometimes we all know that we as officers, sometimes, you know, there's a fine line. And sometimes during that fine line, we might cross that line. And when we do cross that line, there's accountability that we all have when we cross that line. 
Now, how do we cross it? And how do citizens able to make a complaint is one way. Because, you know, one thing that we have to look at is, you know, there is a complaint process that we have to go through as well. And how do you complain? What is the, what is the procedures? You know, do I go down to the police station? Do I send a letter in? Do I email? Well, you can do all of those. You can do all of those if you have a complaint uh, on an officer uh, based on the situation. Now, there's, there's all levels. And, you know, when you file those complaints, some people say, well, you know, they just don't overlook my complaint. Well, not necessarily. Because if that is a problem, a systemic problem, then the department has to take a look at it. And if you've sent it in more than one avenue, somebody is going to look at it. And sometimes that will also um, help an officer, uh, help other officers as well, because if they have someone there that they don't even know that they are corrupt or doing something unethical, then they won't know. I know I've got OPS packages or been in internal affairs based off something that somebody else did. And I just showed up on the scene and I was put into it because one thing, they saw my name and they saw the other officer's name. But then after it all got worked out, you know, that other officer had to pay the, you know, the concept, make the consequences and deal with that accordingly. So what we want to do is any citizens out there, if you have any questions, unmute yourself, come on up and ask the question, because this is your opportunity to address street officers. Anybody? This is, this is, you don't get these opportunities every day. Hey, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. So, so if, say if I get pulled over, do I have the right? So if they say I'm speeding, do I have the right to ask them to show me proof of me speeding? You can ask them, but they don't have to show you. Got you. Oh. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Booker. Just mute yourself. Uh, hold on. Mute yourself. Oh, I thought it was muted. I thought it was muted. Okay, so we had a question in the chat that uh, basically asked, uh, what do you guys as law enforcement think about using cameras or surveillance to detect guns in public places? Is that privacy concern? Um, is it well received or is it skeptical? I asked for kind of clarification on, um, you know, was he was he talking about some type of technology that can see through clothes? His response was, my specific, my specific thought was, after the talk about Pocket USA, if there's a traffic stop and an officer has a body cam or something that sees a gun and is able to do something about it, no. if it notifies another officer or partner or something that a gun had been spotted. What? Um, I let me jump in on that. In the state of Georgia, we got some of the most lenient gun laws. And just because there's a gun present doesn't mean that it's illegal. And in the state of Georgia, you don't even have to have, uh, I think, a gun license to have a gun. If you are able to go purchase a gun legally, technically, you can have a weapon. So if even if we detected a gun, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a crime being committed. Now, it's good to know. Like a lot of times, I'm not worrying about the person with the gun license. A lot of times people that are law-abiding citizens, when you walk to the car, they're going to tell you, well, sir, I have a, a gun in the car. And you're like, okay, that is perfectly fine. As long as you don't reach for yours, I won't reach for mine. And a lot of times it, it that lets you know that you're dealing with a law-abiding citizen. I'm worrying about the joker that got it stuck up under his leg, sitting on it, and one quick move and stuff like them, the ones I'm worried about. So I think any technology would be great. It's just like during the protest, we had facial recognition and all of that came in big handy last summer. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people, some people feel like that's violating people's civil rights, but Atlanta and most metropolitan cities are video recorded. There's cameras everywhere. And some of them are running your face through a facial recognition and things like that, which for law enforcement, that's a, a handy and very useful too. Yes, in, in, in say, Georgia, um, yeah, in Georgia, the one thing that we all have to understand is that you can you can open carry. 
you you can open carry all day long um, in the state of Georgia. So, but unless there is a signage posted outside of an establishment saying weapons are not permitted, then you cannot carry that weapon openly inside of that establishment. Same thing about that is when you have a permit, okay, you have a permit to carry. So that permit to carry only allows you to carry in places that, um, that is not uh, identified as a place you cannot carry your weapon. So even though you have it concealed and it says no weapons allowed, you cannot carry that weapon inside that establishment. And one of them is state, uh, federal, uh, and some local um, uh, offices, as well as some churches and things and, um, and schools. So you have to be careful in some federal buildings. Uh, with carrying weapons. Some of them don't even require them. You can't have them on your premises. So what if you have it inside your car? Uh, on the inside of a federal building says there's no weapons. So you have to be very careful about places that you carry those. It's the same way if you carry a weapon, mistakenly carry a weapon and put it in your bag and go to the airport. And it goes to TSA pre-check. You go in the it, Well, no, it's, it's, if, you have, if you do not have a permit, you will go immediately to jail. If you have a permit, they will they will go ahead on and take your weapon and you will be given a citation and you will show up in court. So that's the only difference about that if you do have one and you don't have one. So because they already have you fingerprinted, they already have your information on file, then when you get to court, they might take away your permit to carry. So that's where you have to go to the, you know, uh, the judicial system to handle that. So that's that's some tidbit tips that's out there that some people really, really don't know. So having a permit versus having a permit, I know that Texas is changing their laws. Uh, we had a kind of like a conversation on that. So it's kind of like open carry what we have here in, in Georgia that's in Texas. So you have to be very careful and know the municipality when you go into another uh, state when you have a, a weapon that you carry. So that is that is very, very important. So uh, do we have so, anybody else? Somebody hold on. Else? So, so uh, to address uh, Nathan's question, okay. kind of like, you know, you know, hit on it. But I think I just saw him uh, post something that he's in Iowa. Um, let me kind of read it. Uh, he says, so I'm from Iowa. We have similar laws or not needing a permit to carry. I was just curious the general thoughts, but it's the same concept if it's put up really in any public place, school, airport, et cetera. Right. So so Nathan, basically, um, we we're not we're not walking around actively carrying that type of technology unless they can put it in an Oculus of sorts and we walk like a VBR or something around our eyes or something that can see through cars. Outside of that, there's really no technology that I know of that on a traffic stop that we'll be able to like see those type of objects inside of a vehicle. But just like the officers addressed previously, you're running into issues where, you know, it's not illegal to carry. So I, I, I doubt that that would be a situation where, you know, that technology would even kind of exist. Well, you know, I think, I think it's, somebody had brought it up before. It's, it's very strange how that you can go and purchase a gun. Don't have to have no permit. Don't have to have anything when you purchase that gun. But if you go buy a car, you gotta have a driver's license. You gotta go sometimes the driver's ed. And that car is something that you, you can you control. So, you know, we say, okay, I understand the second amendment rights and all this rights to bear arms. But I think in one case of it, it would kind of make it a little bit more simpler if they say, OK, yes, you're going to have a weapon, but you need to be trained on that weapon. Because really, people really don't understand. A large amount of people that have weapons and don't know how to use them, most likely it will be to have their weapon taken and used against them. But so, I think the great Warren Picard taught us in the academy yes. that <laughs> on every encounter, police encounter, a gun is present. So you have to act accordingly for not only yourself and knowing how to use it. Because one, if you don't know how to use it, it can be used against you. And then two, you don't want to 
hurt somebody else not knowing what you're doing with it. Ricard, I saw you come off the off the, off the mute. Go ahead. Hearing his name. No, I'm just surprised he remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, anybody else? We got some more citizens out there. Come on, y'all. This is your opportunity. Don't be shy. All right. Th this is me, Kelvin. Um, how you doing? Um, I was typing it in, but the opening came up. So I'll say this. I'm in the military. I've been in for almost two generations. We have a culture in the military where if, if, if we see anything wrong, and it's regardless of rank, if it's a it's a enlisted person, sergeant major, all the way up to officer, if we see something wrong, especially the big things like sexual harassment, see something, say something. I wonder in your culture in law enforcement, is there such a culture where when some of you guys peer to peer see something that ain't right and somebody is on the wrong track, not doing the right thing, that you guys will grab them up or do you turn the other way? Is there, is there an inclination to want to turn the other way? Because when you make that call, you want the cavalry coming. You don't want to be blacklisted. You don't want the, you want that backup coming. But is there a culture that there's the courage to say, you wrong, man, and you making us look bad. Because me personally, I have a lot of friends being in the military who are law enforcement. And I, I am absolutely not with that um, defund the police. We need police because there are people that look just like me that I want to go to jail. <laughs> okay, They need to go to jail. Right. But we need the good, honest people you know, I know that there's some good cops there that are tired of, of the bad ones making them look bad. You know, so is there a culture within your culture and your society that really says, you know, hey, I'm going to grab this guy up, man. You're making us look bad. Don't do that again. I see where you're heading or whatever, that you have the courage and the openness and the freedom to say something. I think... Oh, uh, that's a great question, Kelvin. And we've been asked that question differently over the years. And it's one of those things from a law enforcement standpoint, most of us in here are very vocal. And for me, anytime I've ever had, I've had to call the FBI and get somebody to lose their job. So, and it's one of those things where nobody hates a dirty cop or somebody doing something wrong than a good cop. And your moral compass should tell you, I don't want nobody treating this person like they, if they, that could be my brother, that could be my sister, that could be my family. And for me, it's one of those things where a lot of stuff gets addressed in house or for example, like if we all in the same unit, it might get addressed in the office in the, at that incident, like, hey, let's, let's talk about that. Or in the locker room. And I think from the public standpoint, they want to see it. They want to see me walk in with a head like, I got me one. Yeah, he was doing wrong and I turned him in. And the public does, and it just doesn't happen like that. There's a lot of people as officers. Some people come in with different wet backgrounds and different ways of life. And to them, working in some urban communities, they may view it as everybody's a thug, everybody's a perp. And it takes them being schooled by somebody that may look different than them to help them understand that these part, these people are you victimizing them twice because you victimizing them because where they live and because of their skin color. And I think that is one of those things where you don't necessarily get to see it, but it does happen uh, contrary to belief because for me, I don't want a dirty cop, uh, somebody doing something wrong by, around me because then if they did that to you and you see us together, you think I'm the same way. And so I've always been able to speak up and speak out. I've never had a problem with that, but everybody's different. Yeah, in most cases, most cases of that, you know, it, it comes into several stages. 
And, you know, sometimes it's, you sit there and you talk to them. Sometimes you turn it over to a supervisor. And then sometimes, depending on how egregious it is, then it, it, it goes straight to, you know, the uh, internal affairs office. Go ahead, Bakar. Yeah, I want to thank Kevin, because that was an excellent question. Uh, here's what I actually believe. Uh, I've always wanted the law enforcement to have the level of discipline and, and dedication to service that the military has. But we're, we're lacking in that area. We have individuals like Tase that come from different backgrounds, uh, different family structures and so on and, and so forth. So they don't necessarily believe in holding each other accountable. They believe in individual accountability. So they expect that person to step up and take responsibility and take ownership of their shortcomings, but that doesn't always happen. So we need individuals to step up. I worked in Turner Affairs for nine years investigating uh, inappropriate behavior from police officers. And I would get letters in the mail from police officers saying that, Picard, I'm writing you because I know that you will hold uh, someone accountable for their actions. Uh, and I will always write them back and say, thank you for the letter, but send it to your supervisor. And I will wait, you know, 20, 30 days to see if the supervisor took any action or, or even if that communication ever happened. But I'll still end up doing the investigation because that communication didn't happen. And when it come down to the bottom of why it didn't happen, it's because everyone wants to be liked and they do not want to jeopardize uh because these are careers alone. When you step into law enforcement, you're talking about 30 and 20 year careers. They do not want to put themselves in a situation where they're reporting someone's actions lives for the longevity of their career, which means that it will repeat it over and over again that so-and-so told on so-and-so is not a good person to work with. So I understand those dynamics, uh, but that's something that the military does not have to work, work, work around because the level of discipline is so dedicated and different. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I appreciate each one of you guys chiming in. Um, you know, we we see the things that go on from the public view. Uh, one of the most um, potent examples or poignant examples that I remember is the Charleston, South Carolina, with uh, Slayton, uh, Michael Slayton, and when he in that situation when he was alone. He actually, one thing happened. The two brothers who arrived on the scene after him, they corroborated everything that uh, Clayton of uh, Slayton said it was supposed to be until their lawyers said, there's video out there and they retracted their statements. I know that, I know, well, that's what happened. Right, I believe. But, but um, I know that, the, I know it's gotta be tough. I know if you got a, a shift in a certain area, at two o'clock in the morning, you want backup to be there. I got it. I'm in the military. You want that team to be there. And you don't want nobody thinking, oh, that's the snitch or that's whatever y'all might say, you know? So I know it's gotta be tough. But on one hand, y'all y'all, y'all wanna be the good guys that you are, you know, and, and weed out the bad guys, but it seems like the bad guys can put so much pressure for the good guys to just keep quiet and look the other way. And, and uh, I just wonder, I, I don't wear the uniform, so I was wondering what the culture is like there, you know, that's all. But good I, answers. I, I think that, you know, we have seen cases just recently, it was a female officer who had stopped her partner from choking um, another uh, person out. And she had like 19, 20 years on and they ended up firing her. And it took 15 years uh, later that they came back and gave her her pension and uh, letter of apology and things of that mm -hmm. nature, where she did the right thing. And you know, mm -hmm. you know, that that is something that you have to go back and say, yes, that was a culture. Then, how are we correcting it now? And I think that's one thing that we have to really look at because you know our past has not always been perfect in law enforcement 
especially in the uh, community of people of color. So we have to keep that real and understand that to the point of saying, okay, how can we address this issue and make this, you know, a, you know, officers follow a certain standard and say, hey, if you're doing something wrong, I'm gonna address it to you. But if it's so egregious, I can't go with you on this. I'm gonna write up what I saw, what on my situation. Now you gotta figure out yours. And at that point, that done put me in a bad position. That just put me telling my truth from what I saw, not what you know you told me I saw. And you know, so that's what we got to go in and be able to do it. But we really appreciate uh, you you, you um, putting that out to us, uh, Danny. You got you had your hand up, and then we go and go with Toy. Yeah, Brandon. I don't know if yeah yeah yeah. How you doing? I don't know if there's any uh, higher brass on here tonight or if even Dre is on here, but I want to get back to a different topic of uh, bridging the police with the community. And I want to know why, if Dre is on here, I would love for him to answer. How come the um, department is not keeping the community more abreast of one of the worst murders that has hit this city in many, many years in Piedmont Park? While I understand an investigation, you have to keep that you know, tight-lipped, you can't tell us much, but they should update the community way more than they have been because there's a lot of people on the edge still and um you know that's just a personal opinion but i definitely think that's you know something that needs to be done Can I I don't jump know in on that right so, yeah. Danny, i want to jump Danny. in on that like they yeah. should keep you you got the people abreast but they should keep the community abreast about all murders not just because it happened in piedmont park but you can't no, get that, the but community but, without updating the perpetrator at the same time. Exactly. So <laughs> you you as a, when you when you hold an investigation, you trying to give as least as possible so that you can do your job. Because if I say, well, I'm looking for a subject in a red jersey, guess what? Everybody, the suspect, oh, let me get rid of this red jersey. And well, I, get, I think that the fact that it happened in P my part make it more uh high profile. But I think that any murderer, or anybody that lose their life, it should be get the same attention. To, to be honest with you, I think it's obviously. Brutal, but at the same time, a, a lot somebody losing their life period is is horrible. Yes, it is. But some some as you said, some murders are more high profile than others. And just made up, it may be a bad analogy. While it's going to take us a long time to know exactly what happened in Afghanistan, at least the president came out and spoke to us today. You know. Uh, Chief Bryant should come out or whoever is a, is a, whoever it is up there that, you know, does that should come out and just update us a little bit more often. That's all. Just a, well, that's a what, what, what more update can they give you and say this is an ongoing investigation and our department is working hard. So I just gave you one. And I well, it's got to be better than what Charles Hampton gave on it, Monday. But, but, but I understand what you're saying. It's the same thing about Afghanistan. I can tell you what, you know, I've been there. So I already know. What, what some of that politics is being played based off of that. But the situation that you have to look at is, yes, there's an ongoing investigation. Yes, we want the public to know, but we also have to, you know, walk that uh, thin line and that fine line when we do that. So yes, we understand Piedmont Park, but we also have other parks that people have been murdered in too. And some of those cases are still cold today. So, you know, we have to look at that and say, hey, how can we make that better? Somebody knows something, but it's somebody coming forth and telling what they're doing. And then before you know it, the chief will come up on the stage and say, hey, we, we, we have a, you know, a person in custody for, for that. And that will just come out at the press. So we will, we will address that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit somebody real quick. Toy and Chris, Chris uh, go ahead, Jones. I know you got a rebuttal. Go ahead, Kate, uh, Jones, I'm talking to you. Get him. Can you hear me? We can hear you. So, um, I mean, I agree with that. We can't update. I'm talking to Danny. Uh, Danny need to go ahead and apply for police because he always trying to tell somebody what they need to be doing. <laughs> but you you can't update. You know, I'm scared of guys. You know that. <laughs> you can't update people on everything that that's going on on a case. Just like Ty said you know, you might be talking to the perpetrator. And so we, if we tell what we have, then it's kind of like, 
oh shit, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. Then, you know, whatever information we had is already out there. I mean, is there something about that case you want to tell us? <laughs> no, no, I, I, totally, I totally get where you're coming from. Maybe I'm trying to say more so to try to continue to make the residents, especially in that area, more at ease rather than more on edge. That's all. I, I get understand exactly every murder what has, you, you know. I get exactly what you're saying, and you are correct. But I think that it's, it'll also be a bias if they are to show more towards one than the other. Like I get that it's Piedmont Park and I understand that's part of Midtown and so forth and so and the LGBTQ community, I understand all of that. But what I'm saying is from a department standpoint, I feel like they gotta show the same effort on that case as they do on any. And then working investigations, I'm not showing you my hand. I'm gonna give you a generic statement. I'm gonna give you enough for you to understand what's going on. And then I'm gonna do my job. I don't care about what the public know or not, because until that person is caught, I don't want to inform the killer of what I'm doing so he can try to defeat me and stay, make my work harder. No, I get it. I get what you're saying. I respect that. And and Danny, uh, we are hiring too. <laughs> I told you, Ivy, I need to be the part where I don't have to carry a gun. Put him at a crosswalk, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Toy. We're going to go with Toy. She. Is he or she? I can't. T O I. Who is that? Toy. T O I. Toy. Are you there? Can you hear me now? You got the hand up, so I just want to know. Sit. All okay. right. We'll wait till she come back. Christelle, you got a question. Yes, I do. Um, I'm switching gears, but uh, I, my question is about body cams. Are they required in every state? And if an officer does not have his body cam on, are there any re repercussions? Is he reprimanded? Is that yes. something that? Oh, yes. <laughs> Let me answer that one. <laughs> right before I got, I retired, I got jammed up for not having mine on. And I wasn't even doing, I was working an extra job in my car doing nothing. So yes, you, we are in certain cities, they are slowly coming to be something that's everywhere, but some don't have body cameras yet but if you get caught without it i am with trust me I, i'm a firm a person that was held accountable so yes you have to have your body camera on functioning charged up and all that and you gotta dock it after each shift and all that so yes now ty speaking for uh atlanta police department but every department has their own policy on body camera use. That should be a policy, but it's up to every individual department. So it's not standardized nationwide, um, statewide, or even countywide. It's each individual department. And we have over 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States. And, and you also have to remember that some, some departments still don't have body cams because they, 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 they just can't afford it. Well, well, even more worrisome is the fact that those departments that do, and I seen somebody in the comment section asked about the uh, blue wall. Some some departments that do have body cam footages, you have like situations that I think I just saw a story where an incident just came to light um, based on something that happened two years ago, and it was on body camera. And I'm sure the superiors in that department did see that their officer violated, but why is it two years later and it's just coming to light? So you have to deal with that as well. You have powers that be that, you know, don't look at body camera footage as holding their uh, officers accountable. So that's an issue in and of itself. Well, guys, uh, anybody else got a question? Cause it is after eight. If you guys, uh, we usually end at this time. Uh, Hi, this is Toy. I go apologize. Ahead. Go ahead. It's been so long to come back. I just had a quick, just actually looking for some comments from you all in regards to, I just heard a quick blurb on uh, NPR this week about officers being there. There was a grant awarded about officers being trained to actually, um, collect blood, draw blood at a scene 
to see whether a person is text, test positive for alcohol or drugs. What are you all's thoughts on that? And uh, that's it. Oh, anybody that worked, I don't think nobody in here worked DUIs and I'm not familiar with it, but a lot, they do take a lot of training in reference to what they do and how to administer. So I don't know if somebody that's uh, in that field uh, have they been mandated to do that or not, but usually they got different, a whole lot of different training that goes into a DUI officer. It's not just somebody that says, I want to pull people over for being drunk. Like, no, nah, usually the other officers call the DUI officer because he's uh, more trained in that field of work. Ty, is Craddock still on? So there's a so there's a sep a totally separate officer. So if I get pulled over and I'm suspected of drinking, mm -hmm. there's another officer that is called to the scene to do any kind of testing or anything like that on me. Correct, because when it goes to court, they're going to ask what type of field sobriety test, what type of training you have to administer the field sobriety test. Uh, so just like a traffic cop, just like a traffic cop uh administering radar or a laser they're going to ask you what type of training have you had was it calibrated different things like that so yes they they have to there's a whole different office if you look at the the wendy's incident that's exactly what happened in that the first officer uh was a regular officer and then i think officer roth was a dui officer i'm i'm, I'm gonna come i'm gonna track that from you that's not necessarily the case. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone from our hit and run unit. I mean, from the DUI unit, from the hit unit is what we call it. Some of us are actually trained um, for the DUI. In regards to the blood draw, um, the you would have to get consent. Um, it only would it be exigent circumstances where we would be able to take the blood without them um, without them consenting. And in order to do so, you would have to have a search warrant to do that. Um, so of course you would have to go in front of a, ju a judge, tell them why an exigent circumstance would be they're passed out and you can't determine whether it's drugs or any other medical, you know, if it's what type of drug it is, or if it's medically related at all, you would be able to draw blood at that point um, with a search warrant, but you can't just, you can't just shove a needle in somebody's arm and take their blood without them either consenting. So what we would do is generally, if it's, if you suspect it's alcohol, you would read the implied consent card, you would say, do you submit to the testing of your breath? And they'll say yes or no. If they say no, you'll ask them if they want to do blood. Or if they get down to the station and they can't blow, you can ask them if they'll do blood. But if they say no, you can't do it and you can't just make force them or make them give their blood unless you get a search warrant. Credit, oh. that wasn't the question. The question yeah, was yeah. I was just yeah, because you know, like I said, it was I understand all about about consent, but they were I was just getting you all's thoughts about the entire process of now taking blood, having the police officer have the ability yeah. to draw the blood on the scene of whatever is going on to be tested for drugs or alcohol. I mean, I see, I see that Gypstick is offering it as a class. It's called officer phlebotomy. I, I'm not going to do it because I'm not messing up, but it is an option. I, I, I don't feel comfortable. Do I wouldn't do that. I, I don't like blood as is, but nonetheless, I'm not taking nobody's blood. But I mean, I feel like if you're comfortable with it, because Grady's Grady gives pushback. And the reason why is because if you take some, if you take, if you take a, an arrestee, a DUI arrestee, Bryson, be quiet. If you take a DUI arrestee to Grady and ask them to draw their blood and they even have consented for it, the nurse is going to be, she, she may, she may, and very likely is going to give you pushback because once they take the blood, once the nurse at the hospital takes the blood, once it goes to court, they're going to be subpoena and they don't want to show up in court. And, and just some background real quick. I'm just looking this up. Uh, so basically, it looks like for the beginning, it's just going to be state troopers um, and then a couple specialized units, the heat teams and the Nighthawks. And it starts in October. But I guess there's like 12 states already that are doing this. So I don't know. Well, it sounds state like troopers are, uh, state troopers are definitely taking your blood. So y'all better be ready. Any other questions? Speak now, forever hold your peace until the next time.
Well, I, hey, can I go real quick? I, I would just like 